All right. So this is why Linux does not suck, not even a little. My name is Brian Leonard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you have not watched Why Linux Sucks, you should probably watch that before watching this one. <laughs> you guys are here to stay. You're good. Uh, so let's uh, let's dive in. We're gonna be talking about why Linux is awesome. <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the thing about Linux. It's not awesome. It's fiercely awesome. It's intensely awesome. It's so intensely awesome that it inspires us to have an emotional reaction about it. Now, we could say the same thing for Windows or for Mac users. Well, not for Windows users. <laughs> <laughs> Mac users tend to have an emotional reaction to it as well. They love their Mac so much they hate everyone else. But there's two huge differences between Linux users and Mac users. Who <laughs> knows how to use computers? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Hey, you guys probably sense the theme here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Over the last several years, and by several I mean 10,000, however long the versions of X11 have been around, X or X386. How many people ran X386? Oh my lord, was that painful. But it worked, right? It got the job done and it worked. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> How amazing is it to see not one, but two projects yeah. to fix it? And not fix it, but start over and do it theoretically right. Now, a little late on one of them, kind of. Technically, they shipped 1.0 for way later. It doesn't, doesn't really work. But, but technically, they did ship 1.0. And they're making massive progress, so much progress, in fact, that KDE is now functioning really well. Their K1 compositor sits on top of Wayland and has some issues, but is mostly all the way there and is working really well. Performance is even good. Now, Mir, I have no idea, but supposedly it's going to come with a version of Ubuntu over the next year or two, and it's going to kick ass. But right now, we have Wayland, and it's coming. And it may be a little late to being our default display manager, but it's coming. And X11 is kind of on its way out in that regard. But it gets even better than that, because they're still developing X11, which means even if you like it old and busted, you can keep using it. <laughs> I mean, isn't that cool? If you're a Windows user and you're like, man, I sure do love web pages and tiles, but I sure do wish I could still run Windows XP, but have like both. You can't do that. You can't mix and match. We can't. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Again, C Twitter. Yes, 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 I know, I know, I know. I took the quote out of context. <laughs> but partly in context. And what this shows is, this is just a straight post on the Fedora mailing list. And there's more to it than that. Like, you know, they wanted to have something usable so we could play with it. But they were looking, they were looking at it and they were thinking, you know what? This is coming in the future. Let's adopt it as early as possible. Let's test it as early as possible. Let's develop it as early as possible. And let's get it out there in the hands of people who might want to stick their finger in it right away. <laughs> it won't be ready. It won't be ready for my grandma for a long time. <laughs> but for us, eh, maybe. maybe. Let's shoot for it. Even if we miss it, let's shoot for it. Let's try to get there. I like that. I like to feel like the people who are building the systems I use are so damn excited about the technology that they can't wait to get their grubby, dirty, donut-soaked fingers all over it and just <laughs> shove it into my OS. Isn't that cool? I mean, how cool is that? Read your hand if you think that's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, let's seriously look at this for a minute. I mean, how different are these really? Not, not that different in, in the sense of what you do, right? Windows, move around on the screen, you open up a file manager and you delete something. It's pretty much the same idea, but with subtle enough differences that, that people yeah. looked at it and said, I can't handle being, being constrained in this tiny little box. I gotta break free. I gotta spread my wings. I gotta fly. I gotta create cinnamon. 
I gotta do it. I gotta make Gnome Shell, but make it look like not Gnome Shell, which the Gnome Shell guys are doing, but I'm gonna do it too. <laughs> and, and you may think, sure, you can make a very good case that we are simply duplicating it. But well, why, why not? Why not just simply duplicate effort? How many people in here read books with dragons in them? <laughs> How about robots? You like TV shows or books with robots? No, no robots. Right? Okay. Dragons and robots. That's robot dragons. dragons. Here's, an even better one. Here's an even better one. How many people here like Firefly? How many people here also like either Star Wars or Star Trek? Whoa, there's overlap. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm saying. 90% of those shows are the same. <laughs> cool, awesome Captain E. Dude, badass shit. <laughs> Variations on a theme. Now, they may not be a ton different, but that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile bringing back Firefly. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it still makes this worthwhile. It still makes Mate worthwhile. Yes, the Mate guys, all they did was fork Gnome 2 and tweak it and try to bring it up to speed of technology. Yes, they're clinging to the past. But you know who else is clinging to the past? Star Trek people. I love Star Trek. <laughs> How about Doctor Who? Doctor Who's been around since I think 1920. That thing's still going. They just keep rebooting it. That is what they're doing with Mate. Cinnamon isn't a reboot, it's just taking something new and making it feel like it's old. It's giving it a retro film noir look to your desktop. And that's awesome. We have choice. And not only do we have choice about what to use, we have choice about what to work on, we have choice about what to contribute to, we have choice about what to tell people about. And that is something that Mac users and Linux users don't have. In fact, it's getting so bad that Mac users and Linux users, and Windows users, have less choice than before. There was an old time when Mac users had a pretty themable system. They don't anymore. There was a time when Windows users had a good system, kind of. <laughs> they made that up. All right, so this is how things use. Gnome is taking more and thin. <laughs> All the awesome stuff was in here. I mean, no, we but we use really weird stuff. I mean, when was the last time you watched an awesome, like, tech movie where, like, the nerds Gonna hack it. I'm gonna open a socket and connect to the thing and the dinosaurs are gonna get free or something. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the OS that you're looking at looked like, you know, Windows. No. Mac? No. KDE? No. I mean, it, sometimes it's KDE, but they tweak it. Um, you know, and, or no. No, it doesn't happen. And what they do is they create completely new, crazy-ass desktop environments. And that's what kind of consisted of this little sliver right here. Yeah, what the, what and the then we jump from forward Jurassic to today and we've got a whole sort of <laughs> <laughs> And you're making a Hollywood movie, you don't have to create it now. You've got some weird, funky looking one that sometimes maybe no one's ever even heard of. And, and it looks and awesome. Look and so you get to sit down at your desktop and you get to feel like you're actually in a sci-fi movie. You get to feel like the little girl in Jurassic Park. You can just do those awesome things. I mean, how cool is that? How cool is that? It's just cool. It's cool, right? <laughs> it depends. Do you even have a 3D file manager where I navigate through the park to, uh, to open my music or something? There are actually projects that do that. Yeah, there are 3D file managers. That's the thing! You know, are, has one of the major desktop environments adopted it and put it in? No, but I'm sure they will. And then that pie chart's just gonna get more and more fragmented. And that's so cool. Well, some of them die. Yes, because we will murder the patches. That's so much fun. <laughs> so here's here's things. Here's bad things. These are bad things, right? Duplicating effort. How much does that suck? Breaking things that worked before. Well, that's just a dumb idea. I mean, if you have a job and you're constantly breaking things that work, you're going to get fired. User based fragmentation, developer fragmentation, market fragmentation. Those are suck, but they're worth it. That's the thing. It's worth it. It's worth. It. All of that pain, it's worth it when developers are like, man, Canonical, please don't rewrite Unity again. <laughs> it's worth it because in the end, they're building something that they think is worthwhile. And it doesn't matter if Fedora over there thinks it's worthwhile. <laughs> it matters that, you know, you know, Mark in London thinks it's worthwhile. Because in space. Our Mark, our Mark in space thinks it's worthwhile. <laughs> That's what matters. It matters what individuals think is worthwhile. 
And that's what they're going to do. And even if, in the end, the user experience they create is functionally identical to each other. I mean, look at the, the similarities between Cinnamon and Mate. Cinnamon is using a whole different technology stack than Mate. Yet the user experience is really similar, uh, with the exception of like, like one button. Basically the same, but different. And they thought it was worthwhile, and so they did it. And that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Over the last 20 years, Windows has had 95 some odd stupid percent of market share. That has wavered by like two or three percentage points in either direction since 95, 94, something like that. How boring is that? I mean, how dreadfully dull. <laughs> Who wants that in their life? I mean, how many of you have been using the exact same version of the same Linux distribution for the last 10 years? Oh, weird. Nobody raised their hands. <laughs> let's, let's narrow this down a little bit. How many of you have been running the same Linux distro, different versions, for the last 10 years? Really? In the same install or in general? Just in general. Okay. What version are you? What, what distro are you use? Like, I use Debian. Just okay. general Debian? Okay, that yeah. kind of makes sense. Right. <laughs> Debian oh. users just stay with Debian. <laughs> but in general, people are jumping around. All right, how many people change in the last two years? For half of you guys in the last two years changed Linux distribution. How many of you changed your desktop environment in the last year? Most. Good job, bud. So, was that <laughs> awesome? <laughs> awesome, right? Was it exciting? It was amazing. Right? That's <laughs> the guys. I mean, this is what it's about. We are into technology. We're into user experiences. We're into doing exciting things with stuff that can electrocute you. <laughs> this is awesome. This is awesome. And it's all over the map. And it's great. And you can see that here. Look at a bunch of up and down. It'll probably go crazy up high again. It'll probably come right back down again. Uh, well, Arch is consistent. But Arch, is <laughs> Arch is the weird man out. Arch is, seriously, that thing's just going to take over everything. <laughs> Arch is going to be like Skynet. It's just going to go online one day. Like, and we're done. <laughs> and then, you know, like, Orsus is consistent. But, I mean, most of them are just up and down. And Fedora might even exist 10 years from now. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are jumping from one distro to another, from one desktop environment to another, is exposing you to new ideas, to new user experiences, and you take that with you. So if you jump over to Gnome Shell from Unity, and you go, ah, and then you jump from there over to KDE 4, you're going to bring all the best stuff you learned from the other ones over to KDE 4. And that means that if you start working on KDE 4, that thing's going to be better than anything. And that's awesome. That is awesome. That's how you get better at things. That's how you make better computers. That's how you write better books. If you're a writer, do you never read anyone else's book? No. You read books like crazy, because that's your job, is books. If you, if, you, if you are Steven Spielberg, do you only watch E.T. over and over again? Yes. E.T.? Yes. <laughs> my point. It's so awesome that we're jumping around, and it's awesome that this has flip-flopped. And it's awesome that it did that in such a small period of time. Just looking right here, 2007. What the hell happened here? What the hell happened? Fedora just... Why? I don't know. I couldn't quite tell you. I spent... I probably around with it. I think it might have been around release, right but there was no like... Motion, right? you back back on slide. Yeah, what do we got? Oh. What the hell is this? It is, uh... <laughs> 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 Again, PCOS. like one on this one for a year. Wait over here, crazy. Here's where it is now. <laughs> <laughs> Again, drop down to 5%, back up almost You should put PC loss on the Mandrake and take it out of Red Hat. So it's a Mandrake. Aye, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> So you really don't now, back up your slides before you delete one of them, right? I don't really like it. Back up your slides? So you lost one of your slides? So you... Oh, no, it's, it's important. Yeah, no, I, I, there are a couple of slides changed between things, but... Really cool. All right, now, I'm talking about this in a second. I know. I know. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I think long and hard about 
Fluffy slime. <laughs> <laughs> Stick a sock in it. <laughs> Let's talk about package management. Yeah? Hey, Fedora. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. In one sentence. One short sentence. <laughs> what is a good reason that we don't use one package format? Because distributions are different. Because distributions are different. <laughs> <laughs> They're different. They're not the same. Are they close? <laughs> yeah, of course. It's a freaking computer, dude. <laughs> yeah. It has some files and move around and whatnot. But they're not the same. Even if they're functionally different, they think about things differently. They go about things differently. And even if they don't, it was done by different people because they wanted to. Anne McCaffrey wrote a lot of books about dragons. A lot of other people did too. So did Piers Anthony and a bunch of other folks. They wrote books about dragons for people who are 12 years old, right? But they wrote them differently. I bet you if you read all of their stories, you'd find at least two that match up the same. You're like, wow, they wrote the same book. <laughs> they wanted to write those books about dragons, and they did it differently. And they did it themselves because they wanted to friggin' do it. That's why. That's why we did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the code name thing is a, different, is a difficult one. It is a marketing problem and a marketing bonanza at the same time. When Fedora came out with the beefy miracle and a giant hot dog in a dancing suit, <laughs> it was highly made fun of -able. But the mainstream press picked it up because it was ridiculous. And it was fun. And it was fun to say beefy miracle. <laughs> it's still my favorite, guys. You know, I, I got, you know what I was talking about recently? We found and fixed about five or six bugs by having a ridiculous release name with an umlaut and an apostrophe in it. <laughs> like how the first, the first <laughs> Alpha Compose of 19 was utterly busted. It would not boot because there was an apostrophe in your release name. That's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but awesome! <laughs> But here's, here's the thing, so here's a wrap. And Fedora and, and Ubuntu are kind of the kings of this, right? I mean, a lot of the other distros, they have cool things, like they call their, their distro release Luna or something cool. <laughs> Forget that, man. <laughs> Fedora and Ubuntu know where it's at. <laughs> and Raring Rint Saucy Salamander is pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Spherical Cow, I, I dug that one. I dug that they were going with like this kind of theme with like, you know, whatever, but <laughs> I dug that. Sausage That's going to be the one to look out for just based on the name. The <laughs> guys need to step it up. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Here's numbers of software sessions. Terrible. Thank you. They're really, really bad. So bad that no developer can make a living with these numbers. But here's the thing that's cool. For the first time in human history, we're not talking about what if there was a store. We're talking about how do we get the numbers up from where they're at. They're not zero. People are buying these softwares, these, these applications, every day. If not every day, then at least every week or every month. <laughs> this is where we're at. When I first started doing these sessions, we had nothing. We had absolutely nothing. And now we've gone from nothing to four years later having two almost viable stores for Linux. We've never had that before. That means that we get games more than we've ever gotten games before. Now, you could say the Humble Indie Bundle has also helped in that regard. Steam comes along and is doing pretty okay. Not enough to make a living, but enough to augment our sales. So if you're making a video game, now it becomes to the point where, well, I make it, it's, if it doesn't take more than, say, a month or two to make a Linux version, yeah, I'm going to release the Linux version, as long as it only takes me like a month or two. And now the question isn't, how do we make Linux users buy software? Because we know they will. It's how do we make them buy more of it? <laughs> <laughs> and that, and here's the great part, that's the same goddamn question that Windows and Mac users are asking. Is how do they make more people on Mac or Windows buy software? Which means we're tied. Now, sure, you make more money selling Windows software, depending on your art. At least most people do. I know. But it's doable now. We can chart it. We've gone from nothing to 
pretty okay. <laughs> but think about that. Think of how many platforms have existed over the years. Think about WebOS for a second. WebOS came and was like, yes! You guys better, and it was gone. <laughs> they had a store, you could buy stuff. It was great, right? Where'd it go? It's gone. BIOS. Anyone right here run BOS when it came out? It was pretty cool, right? Cool little system. People sold commercial software. There's even an office suite and everything for it. It's gone. It's oh, gone. Order isn't here, right? <laughs> Most of yeah. <laughs> no, so it's, and it's not just that those platforms went away that that happened. I mean, look at the Amiga. The Amiga's still going, and it's questionable whether it's going strong, but it still exists. It's still being actively developed. It's not a viable platform at this point for selling significant closed source software. Linux is. So I make most of my income selling closed source software for Linux, which includes dumb little games. I, I make dumb games. That's what I do for a living. I make development software and dumb games, and I can make my living selling it for Linux, at least for the most part. That's pretty awesome. This, is, this has never happened before. <laughs> and donations. Donations are not great. They're not great. They're not great. But they exist. And they don't just exist in this one application that I use as this example. This is one application that brings in roughly $2,000 a month in recurring subscriptions. That's $2,000 a month that people like you and me have decided, you know what? That friggin' multi-track audio editor is worth it. And it's a multi-track audio editor. We're not talking about a web browser. We're not talking about LibreOffice. We're not talking about a whole desktop environment. We're talking about something that probably only like three people in here would want to use. And they're making about $2,000 a month. That is not going to by itself fund development, but they get maybe a little corporate backing on top of that, maybe do a little, little uh, custom development work for one or two people. Bam, Bob's your uncle. You've got a viable way to earn a living making a specific open source Linux piece of software. It's not easy. It's hard. And most software can't do it. I can't do it. I tried to do it. I failed. But it's possible. And the fact that it's possible is way, way cooler. Now, I think it's way cooler what's happening over here. I think, I think this is way cool. This is awesome. This is all right. That's all right. I like that. Okay. <laughs> How many of you guys used to use a Windows mobile phone? The old Windows phone? Yeah, the old one. I'm not talking Windows phone with the, whoop, I'm a square and all these things. I'm talking the old Windows mobile phone with a start button and Windows Explorer and everything else. How many was that? It's kind of a lot of us for a link. I used to have one. It was actually kind of cool. I mean, it was, there weren't a lot of rigs that ran that. I threw a lot of weird stuff. I actually threw Android right out at one point. But here's the thing. That was kind of cool. That existed. Now it's dead. Killing off old platforms is not so bad. We've got, you know, all these awesome operating systems. And they're really just variations on Linux distributions. Memo to Miko. I mean, it's basically Debian and Red Hat at the top with a lot of different packages changed on top. But they didn't do everything just right. So they died. And part of what they didn't do just right is appeal to all of us. They didn't find a way to make us, me and you, really excited. Android and prove that a at least mostly open source platform could appeal to all of us. How many of you guys have an Android phone? Right? I have a chance though. It's like almost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you guys have an iPhone? Alright, so there's at least one or two more in there. Holy shit, I know you two do. <laughs> Come on, it's not it's not the end of the world. We won't beat you up that bad. <laughs> no. But it's but here's the thing. It proves something to us. It proved to us that you could take not just an open source stack, but a Linux kernel and something where people are actively modding the bejesus out of it and make it a vast, runaway commercial success, both for non-techies and people like us. And it also <laughs> means we have people like Samsung devs who understand Git and commit shit to yes. the kernel, which never happened. You nailed they it. have no idea what they were doing. By having this happen, by having Android happen, Samsung, uh, you know, HTC, everyone else, they're on board with the open source stack that we live in. They're using GitHub. They're, I mean, they're using stuff we know, stuff we live in, stuff that we're building our desktop environments in, in some cases. And that's awesome, which means our general overall Linux, Linux ecosystem explodes. Now, all of these things have died, but we've learned from every single one. For instance, here, we make a decent phone. We don't do that. Um, 
then we've got options coming up right here. And here's what's interesting. Ubuntu Touch. Does anyone know what Ubuntu Touch is utilizing for its development kit? It's using QML and, and Qt. Plasma and Mirror. QML and Qt. There seems to be a consolidation, which is a rarity among the Linux world, that as we're going mobile, we're going to standardize on a development language. We're going to standardize on an SDK with variations. But we're going to standardize in such a way that we're going to make it so even Fedora there can build an app for Ubuntu Touch, can build an app for Plasma and Mare, and, and get that application running on a Fedora desktop running KDE. How bad? Can you run an Android app on your desktop? Not really. Not really. You, you can kind of sort of fake it, right? You know, like in a simulator or whatnot. Yeah. But not really. But now we're actually moving forward with a software stack that's going to allow us to run as, as a developer, to make an app or a game or whatever. That's going to be this one and this one and KDE and Ubuntu Desktop because Ubuntu Desktop's getting it too. And what's even cooler is that Ubuntu Software Center we were talking about is supporting all of that so we can sell our apps through that. And you know there's going to be something similar on the Plasma side. And they've already been trying to do that with some of their projects. That's coming together. It's coming together for the first time ever. For the first time, we've got a standardized site. It's not Mamo with, with GTK. It's not WebOS with kind of JavaScript. It's, it's a completely unified stack with a few variations that allows us to run the same Linux software across desktop, across tablets, across phones. That's never happened before. And there's a lot of that out here in Android. Or Android. So you can make QT apps for Android, but it's not quite so. <laughs> it's not quite the same. You're not going to be making them quite the same. Here's what we're looking at. All these things are dying. And it's sad. It's sad to see them go. But to see them go, we now get something better. And we get something that's entirely different. A bunch of touch and plasma with Mare had no similarities, really, other than the fact that we can use one of the same software development kits on it, and it's both Linux. And it's not just Linux, it's Linux with a shell. It's Linux with a shell, and a package manager, and everything else we know and love on the desktop. And we have a shop. Now, will a bunch of touch be successful? I don't know. I have no idea if Plasma with Mare will ship on a device that anyone can actually buy. I have no idea if that will actually happen. But there's a chance. And for the first time, it doesn't matter for me and for that guy and that guy <coughs> which one of them makes it. Because whichever one makes it, we get Linux desktop experience on our phone with a phone-like experience. Because we get all the tools that we've always wanted on our Linux in the phone, regardless of who wins. And that's awesome. But here's the thing. Only if we as a community come together and say, what if one of these comes out? Okay, we're going to actually buy it with money. <laughs> because the other ones, people didn't. People didn't buy it and they went away. Sell shit to the night To the developers, to the geeks. It's so, really Yeah, so a good, a good example the N950 was... The N950 was way oversubscribed. Yeah, the, the N9 yeah. did sell and the N950, which were Linux, basically Linux desktop they phones. Were. And they were great. They were great little phones from Nokia, but then Nokia went over to the other oh, side oh, and... Yeah. Yeah. Ah! Yeah. I, don't I like guess them. you can say it was really close. It was like this. It was close. close. We that. almost made it. We, we proved that. that we could almost yeah. make it. We yeah. proved that they could make a profit from it. Right. Now we need to do it again, and we need to do it with people that are us. So Nokia, I, there was a lot of great people that worked at Nokia back in the day. Back, back in the day, I think it's like a year or two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they made some really amazing mobile stuff. It was all based on Linux, and it was kick-ass, right? But here's the thing. They weren't necessarily yeah, us. They weren't. Their heritage was in Symbian and a lot of other phones, and that's what their bread and butter was. Not <laughs> organizations behind KDE. That's us. That's literally the friggin' people in this room. That's the people watching this. They are us, and not only that, but they are us in terms of users and developers. They get it. They get what we want. We need to empower them to actually make that happen. And that doesn't need to be us contributing to the project. It doesn't even need to be necessarily us running it on day one and buying the phone. But talking about it, blogging about it, telling our friends about it, that's the way we see these sorts of things succeed. And we have a chance. 
And the fact that we have a chance is kind of remarkable. Because if one of these succeeds, and there's no way we're going to unseat Android entirely, right? I mean, it has too much momentum at this point. It's going to have this big market share. So what's left? What else do we unseat? Yeah. Windows Phone. Windows Phone? Yeah. We'll kill that off. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> iOS? Yeah. Apple doesn't Places exactly. No one has a phone yet. It's still most of the human race. It's most of the phone. human race. It doesn't have a, uh, certainly not an awesome cell phone. Right, a smartphone. A smartphone, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have got a little a tiny, people, yeah, little, little, little candy bar phones. It's probably still 50% though. I don't know. So we're, we're right there. We're, we're literally right there. On the desktop side of things, we've solved all of our technical problems. Not all of them, but we've solved our technical problems to the point where we can throw Linux on most devices and feel reasonably confident it's going to work out of the box. How many times has that worked on Windows? How many times can you install Windows 8 and not need to install a driver just to get your friggin' Ethernet working? I, I, updated the CP, I upgraded the CPU on a Windows 7 system yesterday. I it it doesn't right? boot yeah, anymore. What the hell? This is the thing. <laughs> nope. This is exactly the thing. This is the problem that the other platforms have that we've solved. We've solved all of that. The technical issues are solved. And in fact, we've solved the technical issues so damn well that we need to find new things to come up with amazing solutions for, such as build a complete new display manager, come up with brand new desktop environments, try to bring ourselves to new platforms in ways that empower developers and users and, and everyone to come together and create amazing things. This is the point that we're at. We've never been here before. We weren't here last year. We were not. Last year, we were still having problems. I still couldn't get Fedora to install last year by default. This year, it's fine. It's a, Fedora has a great release. I've harshed on Fedora for years. Most of the time, it wasn't really deserved. But they fixed those issues. The issues I made fun of them for, they're like, you know what? Oh, we're kind of pissed off at Brian for making fun of us. But they went and fixed them. And that's Fedora. <laughs> <laughs> This is where we're at right now, and I can't wear this for that long, it feels weird. <laughs> is it not amazing? Is it not amazing? Now, uh, that's really all I've got to say, except I want to kind of implore upon you. You don't need to buy my software. I, I like my software. I don't need you guys to buy it. I mean, well, I kind of do, but... <laughs> all of you to go out and buy myself, but it is so important that we as a community support fiscally, even with a dollar, literally, some project. Pick, please, for the love of God, pick one project, any project in the world, a dumb one, an awesome one, no, I don't care, I don't care. Pick a project, give them a buck, just a buck. If every Linux user went out and gave just one random project a buck, we would fund the holy hell out of Linux development. <laughs> it would be so amazing. Right now, most of the great Linux development is funded by commercial companies. By commercial companies who have a vested interest. Look at Red Hat. Red Hat is a commercial entity. They even sell some closed source software. And I don't begrudge them for that. They're, they're a great company. It's mostly software that they've acquired. Right. Yeah, the Jesse's Technicalities, whatever. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, Mo uh, Novell uh, and Susan, they do a lot, of, a lot of enterprise work, and they fund some really great projects. But we need more gra grassroots funding, and we just don't have that right now. We just don't. We've got a little bit. You saw that in the slide, like with Ardor. About $2,000 a month of recurring donations. That ain't nothing. That's significant. We need to do that more. You don't do it with Ardor. You don't do it with my software. You, you don't have to do it with anything I even know about. But someone, a dollar. Instead of buying one McDouble, one, <laughs> some piece of software, or if not a software, your local Linux users group. They need money to buy pizzas and punch to get people off the streets to come to their friggin' meetings to get more Linux installed. Something, something Linux related. And honestly, that's it, we're awesome. So that's, that's all I got for this. That's it. Okay. <laughs>